In this video, we'll be looking at the abiotic and biotic factors in ecosystems. So abiotic is non-living and biotic is living. So when we're looking at some of the really important non-living um, factors that make up ecosystems, when we look at things like light, wind and rainfall, it's quite useful to think about a rainforest. So in a rainforest, the trees are all competing for sunlight because they photosynthesize. So these top trees, they all get a lot of sunlight because they've all grown really tall, they've got great big canopies and they're capturing as much sunlight as possible. But what that means for the organisms below the canopy level, it's quite dark. So if you've ever walked into a rainforest, you'd notice that it is quite a lot darker than other ecosystems you might be in. So these organisms down here, they have to live in lower light. Of course, rainforests are called rainforests because they have a lot of rain, a lot of water flows through. They also have quite rocky ground rainforests. They don't have a lot of soil because they get so much rain and, and the soil would move if it was there. Um, but they have a good amount of nutrients because they have all this leaf litter that falls down onto the ground. Now, when we look at things like temperature, we can be talking about daily and seasonal. So places like the desert, the desert will actually have quite hot days, but the nights can be very, very cool. When you're talking seasonally, you'll have places uh, like on the equator, which don't necessarily have the four seasons that we recognize in other places on the earth. They actually will have a wet season and a drier season. All right, so daily temperatures, some places will have uh, 30 degree days in summer, but then have snow all of winter. So temperature ranges seasonally can be very different, um, but also places can have very big daily uh, temperature changes. Topography is to do with the land in terms of altitude, say if you're on a high mountain or very high above sea level, and also depth. So you could be looking at the depth um, below the sea, you could be looking, so where the rocky or where the floor of the ocean is, you could be talking about in caves, you could be talking about the layer where we look at under soil in terms of depth. Now in oceans, tides, currents and waves are really important. Okay, so you might have organisms that live on a rocky shore, they would have to have ways to attach themselves to rocks if they don't want to be moved. Currents bring nutrients and all this movement adds oxygen into the water, which is really important for living things. So again, when you look more specifically at water, you can look at salinity, so how salty it is. So rivers, and you can have lakes that are fresh water uh, versus the sea, which is salt water, or estuaries, where fresh water meets salt water. Now, a lot of organisms, particularly plants, they don't like salty water. And, if, and when you do have plants that grow in salty water, they'll have special adaptations. So a plant that does like it is um, mangroves. Now mangroves have adaptation, adap adaptations such as they will excrete their salt through their leaves. And they'll also have sacrificial leaves, so leaves that will fill up with salt and then drop off the plant so that it can survive in the saltier water. Now pH, um, so this is about the acidity of the soil or the basicness of the soil. Um, certain plants again, a lot of organisms, they have a range. So certain plants will like a slightly acidic soil. Um, but, but with all of these, there's a range of, of what organisms like and don't like. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and water too becomes important for availability. So if your organism's on a rocky shore and the tide goes out, well, that's a good six hours that you may not have um, water surrounding your body. So you've got to consider that. Also too, there's places on earth such as savannas in Africa, where they will have a wet season where animals will migrate to be where water is and to where, where food is um, versus a drier, hot season. Um, when we're talking about substrate, the substrate is the surface on which an organism grows or is attached. So again, you could look at things like barnacles at the, at the rocky shore and how they attach themselves to rocks. Um, or there could be different sorts of plants that attach themselves to things as well. Space and shelter is important for organisms as well. So if, you, if you're, you don't want to compete for space, there's plants that will actually do things where they will, they do a thing called alleopathy, where they'll poison basically the ground to stop other plants growing right near them. 
Um, and a lot of plants too will have adaptations with how their seeds are dispersed so that there's not lots of the same plants right next to each other. And organisms being able to find shelter can be really important too. And it might be in terms of hunting or just being able to rest at night or to hibernate. So shelter is important. And again, oxygen, non-living thing, very important to organisms, both in water and on land. So all of these things have a range as well. So ecosystems and organisms will have a certain range for survival. So what is the hottest temperature an area will have or the coolest and how will those organisms survive? Humans are an interesting organism because we're the one organism that can essentially survive on all continents on earth because we can take shelter with us. We can, if it's, if the temperature changes severely daily, we can put on warmer clothes or cooler clothes. Um, we can go into air conditioning. Uh, so we're this, one, we're this one organism that we can basically travel and live on any ecosystem because we have a lot of control over our non-living um, parts of the environment. Now when we look at biotic factors, so these are the living things, so your animals, plants, fungi and bacteria. And what's really important to living things is an availability of food. So have you got enough food in an area to eat and survive? Do you, can you stay in one small part of an ecosystem or do you need to travel to find food? Your, the number of competitors that you have. So you can look at this competition um, between organisms, not even just of the same species. So let's say that there has been something's happened and there's a lot of a food source. So there might be a lot of a certain plant has grown because there's been a lot of rain or there might be a lot of things that animals prey on. So there might be a lot of mice because there's been a, a lot of their food source. And what will happen is their numbers will go up. Now the predators that eat these things, their, their numbers will actually track that. So if the food source's numbers go up, then the predator's numbers will go up. But what starts to happen when you reach this point well, you start having a lot of predators eating all the food. So, of course, the food source goes down. So as the food source goes down, so does the survival of the competitors. So they will drop down and you will have this continuation going on. Um, availability of mates is really important. So some or, um, organisms are really solitary. So they spend a lot of their time trying to find mates. So we watched in class the things about how um, birds of paradise try and attract mates. Um, you've got animals that will fight, such as your lions down here, and there'll be prides of lions. So availability of mates is very important to organisms, the number of predators in an area, and also disease-causing organisms. So not only humans are affected by disease, so you can have bacteria that affect other animals. So I have a video here you can watch on definitions of biotic and abiotic factors. And I sort of mentioned this a little bit before, so ecosystems will have limiting factors. So anything that makes it difficult for a species to live and grow or reproduce in its environment is called a limiting factor. So I now have an activity for you to do. So what we're going to do in this one, you're going to pick um, an ecosystem. So make a new page in OneNote or create a PowerPoint. Select an ecosystem from the list below. So the ecosystems you can choose from are ponds, coral reefs, desert, rainforest, tundra, savanna, or alpine. Now, you can be very specific. So you could pick the Great Barrier Reef, you could pick the Amazon rainforest, or you could just look at them in general. And then what I would like you to do is describe both its biotic and abiotic components include at least three labelled photos or diagrams of both living and non-living things found in your chosen ecosystem and include a diagram of a food web. So for example I've got one here this is on the coral reef and there's some information that you can read and have a look at as a starting point if you choose to do that one. There's some other videos down here so watch two of the videos below and record three dot points so this is about parrotfish. If you've ever been snorkeling, you can hear them munching away on the coral. They have very um, big teeth at the front of their mouth. Um, the, this one here is on poison arrow frogs. Oh, I love these ones. So these are praying mantises that mimic flowers. 
And then there's another video here on glowworms and one on how jellyfish stings happen.